Hello, hello. All right. How's everyone doing? Great. Hope you enjoyed your lunch. Got lots of pizza. Yeah. We ordered like a lot more pizza than we needed. So I'm sure there'll be pizza for you to take home. So cool. Um, so welcome to the uh, web panel here at Silicon Valley Code Camp. Uh, this is our 13th year. And uh, I know for myself, I've only been involved for 12 years. But Doug, on the end, I believe you've done at least 12, if not 13. What, years of web or? Of, of Silicon Valley Code Camp. Oh, from the beginning. Exactly. So Doug's beat me by one year. So I've been helping organize and run this for, for 12 years, and Doug's been uh, speaking and presenting for, for 13. So I thought that was pretty awesome. Um, Cool. So what we're going to do today, um, I, I imagine you know all the panelists, but why don't I let everyone run through and introduce themselves and say hi. Doug, do you want to do that? Hi, I'm Doug Crockford, uh, and I need no introduction. <laughs> Especially if you saw his talk earlier today. I'm Steve Souders. I uh, have done a lot of work in web performance, basically speeding up the web. I'm Mike North, and I work with LinkedIn training all of their engineers, and I'm very passionate about helping level teams up and provide new on-ramps into software engineering for people that come from non-traditional backgrounds. Yeah, so I'm Kevin Nilsson, and work at Google on uh, Google Home, which is uh, you know based on Chromium, so very familiar with the web and working in that space, and uh, currently uh, working on Nest stuff as well. So I wanted to kick off the panel with kind of an open-ended question um, for each of them, and, and I'm wondering if you guys can sort of tell the audience what's, you know, one thing, sort of one thing that you're really passionate about in the web today, uh, a lot of recent changes, what is something, you know, new, exciting features that are either ready or will be ready soon um, in the web? Doug, you want to? Um, I'm not excited about new features, generally, I, I'm kind of appalled by a lot of the new features. Uh, I'm more concerned with the thing that should have been a new feature that isn't a new feature yet, which is proper tail calls in, in ES6. Uh, as I said this morning, I think there should be a moratorium on all new JavaScript features until that one is fully deployed. Cool. Um, I have more fodder for the next question, which is the bad things. Let's see, what good things? Uh, well, you know, I mostly focus on web performance, and I remember people might not be aware of it, but there's uh, in the W3C a web performance working group that has come out with a lot of good standards over the last 10 years. And I helped start that group 10 years ago when I was at Google, and we had our first meeting, and we talked about uh, the navigation timing spec, and we knew resource timing and um, user timing would be coming after that. And I said, all these are great, so we kind of outlined those for, this is one of those really long, pointless anecdotes that I was sure. talking about earlier. <laughs> no, it has a point. Um, and we talked about all those, and I said that was good. And it was actually like two years of work to get those uh, done, and you know, eight years to get them adopted, thanks to Safari, across the popular browsers. Um, but anyway, after the end of that discussion at the very first meeting, I said, the disappointing thing about this is it's going to take us years to get these done, and we still won't be able to measure the thing I care about the most, which is JavaScript performance. And so I'm excited. We have now have the long tasks API. Um, I think it's only in Chrome and maybe one other browser, and it's only about 20% of what it you know, is going to be, but it's a start. So I'm excited to get more visibility into JavaScript performance out in the real world. So uh, I, I'm going to be kind of a curveball on this question. I'm more excited about the editing experience around JavaScript. Uh, I came to this language from the perspective of, I, I began as a C++ and Java developer and was used to having you know, features in an IDE that will give me hints as to what's going on and give me a high level view of how my code is structured. And for a very long time, you know, it's been common for people to use uh, 
text editors that have syntax highlighting, like, and very, very few other bells and whistles on top of that. So I'm glad to see um, us getting a little bit more feedback as we work on our code, and those tools are getting better and better all the time. And, and Mike, can you be a little bit more specific about uh, tools that you use, maybe suggest some things that, that people may like? Sure, so uh, I have, I was a big skeptic of Visual Studio Code when it first launched, uh, just especially around you know performance and having like stuff running in the background, constantly checking my code, and I was concerned about the overhead of all of that, but they've turned that into a, an excellent editor. Uh, I think that from the standpoint of like extracting documentation from code, we're getting a lot better about that. So that those are those are probably the two areas that help me pass code to other people and let them ramp up as quickly as possible. Steve, you any any thoughts? I'm curious to see what Doug's answer is to yeah. this question. Hopefully, he'll be in the middle of the spectrum because I'm at the far other end. Uh, 33 years ago, I started programming uh, at my first job, and I used Emacs, and that's what I still use every day. <laughs> Sublime text. Wow, that's a bit of a surprise. Sublime. I, I assume we have lots of Sublime users in the audience? Yeah, yeah. I disabled every feature that I could disable. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, so I, I know, Steve, one of the things that you're super passionate about is, you know, performance and speed. And I'm wondering if there's sort of one tip you can give the audience that, you know, one thing you sh they should keep in mind or, or any, uh, any advice that you would have for folks. No, um, I've got about uh, 97 <laughs> that I'd like to go, go over really quickly. Uh, Ten years ago, the, well, okay, so I'll say three things. The first thing is uh, the uh, golden rule of performance still holds true. I came up with this 15 years ago. 80% um, for all websites, 80% of the time users wait are, is waiting on the front end. And so people focus on back-end performance of the application servers. And if you want to cut your server costs and you get higher server utilization, you can focus there. You could change the server time to zero, and no, most users would never notice. So if you want to make things faster, you got to focus on the front end. Ten years ago, the bottle, so that was item one. Item two, ten years ago, the bottleneck to the front end was the network. That's not true anymore. We've had a lot of network enhancements, but also browser enhancements to get around that. And so today, the bottleneck is CPU, and the number one thing that's choking the CPU is JavaScript. So if you want to create a faster user experience, which is what I really mean by speed, um, you got to focus on JavaScript. Okay. Anyone, anyone else have thoughts about speed or performance? Anything to say? Uh, yeah, generally the performance problem with JavaScript is due to bloat. That there's just way, way, way too much code being loaded, maybe by a factor of thousand or more, um, and that is, is terrible for performance. And, and Doug, what do you like? Is there any intermediate solution there for that? Is it? Yeah, write better code. Um, <laughs> make your program small and efficient. I mean, that I shouldn't have to say that, but you know. I, I, I more meant like asynchronously loading modules or... Uh, no, I, no, I think that's all... Less. No, so you see lazy loading and tree shaking, and I think that's just treating the symptom. That there's still too much code to do what needs to be done. That the tasks that we're doing in browsers aren't that complicated. We're just pulling in all of the stuff that we really don't need. Um, and we're doing it in a way which is really sloppy and bloated. It's not unusual to, uh, for me to sit down with cus a customer and have them loading two megabytes of JavaScript in a page. So, so I guess the question that I would have there is, you know, over time, is it becoming more important to use libraries and frameworks, or is it becoming less important? Like, is that where the bloat's coming from? Or, because I can't imagine the people themselves are writing two to three megabytes of JavaScript. Um, uh, well, they're, they're doing that too. I, they're both problems. So 
there are patterns that somehow have become standard practices which are extremely inefficient and also there you know and much of that is due to programming in teams which are too big and they're mainly too big in the hope that they can be better at meeting milestones but actually I think the opposite is more likely to occur that it, you know the shape of software tends to reflect the organization that made it so if the team is bloated the the result will be bloated and then on top of that we've got these ridiculously huge libraries and platforms and stuff that we're loading stuff off of and a lot of them you know there's the banana problem right and so it, what's the banana problem uh, so the thing that you wanted to load was a banana but you also end up loading the gorilla that's holding the banana and <laughs> and the rest of the jungle that so, problem so i'm curious you said um you know you were probably exaggerating but you said there's a thousand times more code than is needed and uh, I'm just curious, are you saying that like, if we looked at a code coverage tool, 99% uh, of the code is never executed on a typical page? Or are you saying that someone took 100 lines to write something that could really be three lines? Uh, probably the first one, and I, and I exaggerated, probably isn't 1,000, and maybe it's 100, but that's still out of line. I knew that's what you meant, that's why I said 99%. I really wanted to say a million, but I, I pulled it back. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So, so, Mike, I know, you know, like corporate training and building teams and helping uh, teams be more effective and efficient is one of the things uh, you're super passionate about. And, and Doug sort of uh, talked about this problem of teams being too large and inefficient. Yep. Um, can, you, can you share any, any thoughts or any experiences with, you know, helping create effective teams at, at LinkedIn? Yeah, so uh, definitely making the, the teams like smaller and more empowered to to get things done themselves is is a big deal there. Um, and like when it comes to to something like performance, developers are well intentioned. They want to do the right thing, but often they just don't have the tools to um, to make a hypothesis about something like X is faster than Y. I mean, less code is, is certainly a good, you know, uh, like a good rule of thumb to use. I, I like where you're going with this. Are, are you saying companies need to have more performance monitoring tools? And if Absolutely. so, like what kind of <laughs> tools could they, could they use? <laughs> like, uh, wh well, why slow and why web page test are two, two good ones. <laughs> um, but, but more, like I see teams using, uh, when they're interested in performance, they'll basically like they find out something slow, they will guess that it here is a root cause, and they'll run it in their browser a couple times, and then they'll say, "Ah, this seems faster," and they'll ship it. But um, what, what I'm working on right now is trying to help people benchmark an entire app and to see, you know, like from the first byte of code landing in the browser to when our users would say this is done, you know, can we run a real experiment and, you know, like test the uh, two choices all night and figure out, you know, what is the, what do the statistics tell us about this? So making more informed decisions about what speeds things up and what libraries can we eliminate and maybe like the three line solution will do instead of the very robust thing that, you know, 90% of the features of which we don't need. Um, but it's really just about helping people understand what options are available and starting simple, not abstracting too early and then, you know, as you need things, you can let them evolve. Yeah. So, so I guess about 12 years ago, I worked at E-Trade. And I, I always, you know, remember the, the, one of the messages from the CTO when I was talking to him about some of the things we were doing uh, with services. He said, you know, you can't improve anything that you can't measure. And that's something that ever since then I've always, you know, as I built systems, found ways of either writing tests and, you know, seeing what is our test coverage and measuring that, seeing are we getting better, looking at performance, uh, measuring that. It's been super, super helpful to be able to then look back historically and see, you know, are things getting worse? Has this been for a long time? And did the things that we do actually um, make, make changes? So, cool. So, Mike, I, I did want to go back and, and maybe ask again about, uh, you know, I think you talked a lot about, like, performance and, and things like that. But I'm, I'm curious 
on, you know, developer productivity more and like what, you know, things, you know, there's so many new technologies in the web that are evolving every day, right? And to use those effectively, um, using later language features that are going to give improvements and less bugs, one of the things you often have to do is find a way to bring your team along with you, right? So, and, and what tips um, do you have for folks at, at doing that and keeping the team up to speed with the things that, that you want to use in your project and having that consistency where the code is more consistent from person to person? Uh, so, like, I, I think there's a lot that we can just have tools do for us. I mean, uh, for, for example, Prettier is a, a library that's become very popular and I think it pretty much settles the tabs versus spaces debate. You write what you want and then like as you check code in, it becomes consistent. Um, a anything like that is gonna be, it, it seems to cause less friction in teams than all of that kind of stuff being discussed in code reviews and, and things like that. Um, from a productivity standpoint, Again, like I would really encourage people to start simple. Um, it makes me very sad to see someone like building a simple blog for themselves and starting with like a big webpack configuration and bringing in you know tons and tons and tons of tooling when they're just trying to build something that we could have built in like you know 1997 with a script tag and a, a couple little you know lines of, of JavaScript. So like starting simple, evolving from there is, um, it really lowers the overhead of bringing someone new into a team because they don't have to slog through a monolith of, you know, complicated stuff that may not have been necessary in the first place. Um, so, so Doug, one of the things that, you know, I, I often see in, in teams that I work on is, you know, we have new features that, that come to the web um, or any, any programming language, whatever it is I'm doing. And I always struggle with this, this thought of, you know, having a team continue doing what they were doing before versus ha having them do something new and then trying to figure out which is going to be better code, which is going to be less bugs. Um, do you have any thoughts or any, any suggestions on things you've seen? Yeah, so if what they were doing was good, then have them keep doing that. Yeah. And if what they're writing is crap, the new features aren't going to make it any better. Mm -hmm. That uh, there's way too much excitement about new features. Most mm -hmm. of them are, are distractions, yeah. and some of them are uh, pits. Like in ES6, we added classes, which I recommend nobody use those. Um, but they're really popular because they're people who were trained in classes and will never get to the the functional thing, and so it's a crutch and they're writing stuff which is too complicated and too slow and all of that stuff and they're never gonna get better. So getting excited about the new feature I think is the wrong way to think about it. Sure, sure. I, I think you have to, um, take into consideration benefits of the new feature other than just a repackaging of the code that you have now. The example that comes to mind is very obviously simple to know the outcome, but at the time, when I was running the My Yahoo team in like 2002, like we weren't using CSS. I mean, remember HTML markup and attributes, like width and color and things like that? Everything was written that way across all of Yahoo. A lot of find and replace. Yeah. A lot of so, regex. And so, you know, we were like, well, should we rewrite everything and take advantage of CSS? And it was kind of a hard call. Like, it seems obvious now, but, you know, we didn't know what the impact was going to be, performance and maintainability and things like that. And so we rewrote everything in CSS, and, of course, it was better and easier to maintain. So for there, I mean, like, hopefully things were good the way they were, but we saw that by rewriting this in a new format that it would come, there would be risk of errors and things like that, but it would come with benefits um, we hoped. And so, I don't know, there might be some things like that out there, like maybe not classes, but some features where you're basically, when everything's done, you're going to have the same functionality you have now, but there will be benefits from it in terms of maintainability or onboarding that would justify the change. And uh, 
you know, Doug, you mentioned classes is something you would avoid. Um, oh, yeah. So classes were a really important step forward in, in the history of programming, but it shouldn't have been the last step. And we've gotten stuck there. And, you know, there's a paradigm that comes after classes, which is going to be much more productive. Um, it's not a feature, it's a paradigm. Uh, and CSS was a major change. It wasn't a, a feature. It was a, a new thing. And, you know, sometimes it's difficult to understand why we should embrace the new thing and go forward, but ultimately that's how we make progress. The difficulty is that the new paradigm is indistinguishable from a really bad idea. And so we have a really difficult time deciding which things to go forward on. It's much easier to go forward on features which really don't give us much benefit, particularly syntax. Syntax generally is just noise. It's, it's superficial, it's not important, it's not deep. But that tends to command most of our attention. Yeah, a lot of time refactoring to pick up Big Arrow for no benefit, things like that. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. So is there any other features um, besides classes that, uh, that anyone on the panel, Doug, I don't know you in particular, but that you guys would recommend, Mike? So, uh, Doug, this morning I heard you talk about async and await, and like I see a problem all the time where people will take a long promise chain and they'll refactor and like what used to be parallel, now it's going to be like a sequential thing because they feel like await is just, you know, it's just the way you get a value out of a promise. Yeah, they think it's easier to understand. Absolutely. But it doesn't work right. And it, um, by making async code look like sync code, you're like, a good abstraction does not hide this very important detail away from the developer. So, uh, and, and like you, I see people just you, like making every function an async function without any understanding of what's going on. So that kind of thing, while convenient and like cleaning up code in that it kind of removes some parentheses and, and things like that, you know, in some cases it, things may look better. Um, every once in a while you run into one of these situations where like, there's a gross misunderstanding of what's going on and people never bother to, un to like really comprehend what this means. How is this different from a regular function where everything's synchronous? So Steve, the question I've been dying to ask you has been, you know, all this, this focus around performance and performance, performance, and we've been looking at various things we can do for years. And the question I have is sort of about, you know, ha have we gone too far? Like, where does performance um, versus functionality and, uh, you know, user experience and, you know, things that drive sales and, and, and websites? Uh, can you, can you, you tell us any thoughts you have in, in that area? Yeah, a couple things. Um, you know, my last 15 years has been focused on performance, but I've always said that, it uh, comes after functionality and security privacy. Um, so, you know, your site has to be functional and you can't be uh, hurting your users or, or abusing their data or leaking it. Um, but if you're on top of those things, uh, I think performance is the next good thing to focus on. Um, but the thing I've been thinking about m most recently is and we haven't gotten to the question about like what are we worried about or what's bad about the web, but uh, I worry about, um, this is a very big problem, about how this generation is uh, learning how to misspell everything because domain names are taken and so if you want to have a, a jewelry website you have to name it J-U-U-L. Um, and no one's going to know how to spell. And, and that's kind of a joke, but it's also the short attention spans. Like, it's amazing the impact the Internet has had on this generation uh, growing up. I mean, our generation is almost out of here, so, you know, I'm thinking about those, the next one that's coming. And I think that this focus on performance, it seems obvious that we want to make things faster, but I think it's feeding that uh, addiction to the Internet and screen time that uh, people have, and it's not just kids. You know, I, I have seen adults that, you know, are going through programs to deal with their addiction, and I think that 
feeding this demand for instantaneous response, um, you know, supports that. So I don't know that I would advocate for any company to not focus on performance or make things slower, but I do think we have to look at what we're doing with the web uh, and engaging users in the context of the impact that it has on society. And um, yeah, I think, I think t you know, touting that, you know, we can get you a flight quote in under 12 seconds or, you know, get you really fast internet connections at home. Yeah, I just feel like it's exacerbating that problem. Anyone else? Any thoughts, Doug? That was deep, man. <laughs> it kind of was. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> For a Saturday. So, so I want to I want to pivot to something maybe that the I'm assuming we're going to get some polar uh, opposites here, um, and I'll just kick it off with uh, one word, which is TypeScript, and uh, maybe we'll start on this end with Mike since he chuckled. So, uh, so I think like. First off, for anyone who hasn't used TypeScript before, it's, it is, you can think of it as JavaScript with type information added to it in places where there is reserved syntax in the JavaScript language. Um, so I really like the TypeScript compiler as a tool. And I think like in line with what I was saying before about giving people feedback on their code, uh, I like to see that you know, we're building things that can understand code and that can, you know, for example, um, serve to, you know, parse it, identify all occurrences of a particular thing we're trying to eliminate and give us a to-do list to go and, like, take care of all of those things. The TypeScript compiler is very, very good at that. Um, I do see people a little bit overconfident about how many problems TypeScript or types in general can solve. And you mentioned this earlier today as well, um, Doug where, like, I've seen too many conference talks where uh, people will talk about TypeScript or something like Elm, which also has types, and treat it as a, like, they are setting out to build an error-free program that just cannot fail and cannot uh, run into problems. And that is, that is simply not the case. I do like how it helps us express uh, our intent when we write code in the same way that great comments and great documentation does. Um, but it has its limitations like anything, so don't, don't get overconfident. Steve? Complexity of code is one of the biggest, biggest challenges for the future of the web. Uh, I've seen a lot of really bad code in tightly typed languages, and so I don't think TypeScript is going to I think it will help with some problems, a class of problems, but not with the big problems. It doesn't solve a problem that I have. What's that problem, Doug? <laughs> what, what, what problems do you have, Doug? <laughs> I don't have problems that are solved with TypeScript. Let's just, <laughs> I mean, there are ladies present, let's just leave it at that. That's deep. So, so one of the, one of the, other things, you know, I think kind of related to TypeScript, maybe not, that's not the only area, but uh, one of the things that, that I see as a big challenge today in the web that's, that's constantly changing is, is this sort of the amount of time from when I write a line of code till I see it in the browser. Maybe it is because of TypeScript and you're doing something like that, transpiling, but maybe it's things like Webpack or Gulp. Um, and then those... Not only are they like delaying the amount of time from when I change something to when I can see it, but then they also like add complexity, a lot of sort of magic behind the scenes. Um, like, any any thoughts on recommendations, or are those things helping us or hurting us, or um, any thoughts? I don't use any of those things, and I see the changes instantly. Yeah, but I but I don't think that's where like. A lot of the industry is not, right? They're not doing raw JavaScript, raw vanilla JavaScript. They're, they're sort of, um, you know, a lot of tools in the way, be it SAS or be it, you know, Webpack, Gulp, these types of tools. Um, and it's definitely changed 
the development paradigm for a lot of people, and I think making it significantly harder um, for day-to-day -day work. Yeah, so there are a lot of benefits that could come from transpiling and, and other mm -hmm. sorts of services, but they come at a cost, and some of the cost is temporal. It means it's going to slow you down, and so you hope that it's going to add enough value to overcome the product productivity cost or productivity productivity tax that it imposes. Um, but I think people invest in these tools without having measured that. Steve, anything? You learn really early on, I haven't heard people talk about this, but everyone knows it is any task that you're repeating over and over again, you want it to be as quick as possible. And so, yeah, if I'm writing code all day, and there's an extra 40 seconds every time I want to see those changes, especially if you write code like I do, where it takes eight times before you get it right. You, that's just going to be painful. And uh, I'm sure there are ways to set up a development environment with these tools to have a more interactive uh, environment that I'm working in so I can see those changes more quickly. But um, yeah, like you, you said it when you asked the question, these are tools that are getting in the way and you, you have to either not use them or figure out a way that they can improve the process but not slow down development. Cool. Mike, anything? Uh, so I, I would just encourage people to be unafraid uh, of writing smaller libraries that they, you know, bring together into a larger app. Um, and then you can develop on those smaller units of code and have tests that exist that are specifically for that code uh, rather than having like tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of lines of stuff that needs to be, you know, compiled or transpiled and minified and tested and, you know, all, all of that um, is going to make each iteration of like the hundreds of times per day that you save your file and you want to get some feedback, right? All of that's going to be much, much slower if everything's all together as one unit. So, so one of the biggest challenges I've had throughout my entire career um, has been like staffing and, and hiring a team. You know, that's always, uh, we, you know, one of the things we, we say at, at Google, you know, often they'll say, well, do you have approved headcount? Like, that's not the problem. Getting headcount, we can always get headcount if we need it. But getting the people is always hard. But even before I worked at Google at other places, that was always a huge, um, huge challenge. And I'm wondering sort of the, the panelists' thoughts about, like, the need for a traditional degree. Right, a, a computer science degree um, is something that you know they're they're pumping out a certain number of students every year, but the demand um, for software engineers is, is definitely higher than that um, today. And I'm wondering, you know, things like coding boot camps or you know Udacity uh, is doing a lot of innovative stuff in that area. And I'm wondering, you know, if these things uh, can be used as an alternative and sort of what the the panelist uh, thinks. Mike, so um, I don't. I don't think that. I think there is room for both, for sure. And uh, having having some background in, you know, in computer science, be it through like a degree or something, some knowledge that is reasonably overlapping that that domain that you've you know acquired through some other means. Like, it it is useful to have that kind of person in teams and and uh, working on your projects, but I don't think it's the only kind of engineer that we need. And uh, it's easier than ever these days to, to like, to watch a video course or to, to teach yourself, you know, how to do some of the things that most developers are doing day to day. Um, an important part of that is making sure that at your companies, your more senior engineers, like a, a part of their job, a significant portion of it, is providing some guidance and some technical feedback uh, to everyone else who is still learning. But the, the number of like the number of people that companies are trying to hire that have the skills that we have in this room, that is far, far, far outpacing, as you said, that's far outpacing the rate at which we can graduate people. So either we have to slow down, which might be a very good idea, 
or uh, we have to find a way to create space in teams for you know, folks that might sort of have a more rudimentary understanding of how things work, and you know, that, that, that is a different kind of work that they can start out with, and as they get more into it, they can uh, take on more challenging tasks. Doug, Steve, any, any thoughts? A buddy of mine is a plumber. He owns a high-end plumbing company. And he's worked, we have a 100-year-old carriage house that I rebuilt myself, and I would bring in friends like him. And so he came in early before his company got really big. And then we were adding the fourth, bed, fourth bathroom, and I asked him if he'd come over and do, put the shower in. And he sent his apprentice. And we ended up tearing that wall of sheetrock out because we had to uh, replace all the plumbing that the person had put in. He'd put it in backwards. I think that having people that don't have deeper understanding and, and training and education on the challenges of maintaining complex code is just going to exacerbate the problem. So I agree that it's things like boot camps, open source projects, videos is a good way for people to test the waters. But uh, I think they're going to be very limited in how far they're going to be able to go. And they are going to require a lot of oversight. I think maybe a better way to think about it is finding ways to take these early entrant folks and get them that deeper learning and training uh, as part of their work or on an ongoing basis. But, you know, you want the engineers that, you don't want the engineers that know how to do it, you want the engineers to know why you're doing it that way. And that requires deeper education. Yeah, when I worked at Lucasfilm, I shared an office with an art director. And I got to watch the way he interviewed artists. He built one of the strongest art departments I've ever seen. And he wasn't concerned with their computer skills. He didn't care if they knew Photoshop or, or anything else. He looked at their portfolios. He wanted to know, can they draw? You know, do they have an eye? And he figured, we can teach them to do the rest of it. In fact, we did. So expecting to get exactly the person you want out of a CS school, I think, is pretty unlikely that uh, we're going to have to train our own people. And so you want to look for people who look like they're going to be trainable. And sometimes I look for English majors because a lot of what we do is communication. It's we're communicating with our users, we're writing documentation and specifications and all of that. People having those basic language skills and, and having education or having communication being the thing that they start with actually I think makes them more valuable. That sometimes we'll get too many geeks into a team and we tend to be unsympathetic about the concerns of the rest of humanity, and we make systems that are baffling and incomprehensible to other people, and say, well, of course I've failed, you did that. Um, you know, getting sort of a few normal people in there, I, I think that's really beneficial too. So Doug, any more thoughts on uh, interviewing engineers, finding the right engineer? Uh, uh, yeah, so I want to see a portfolio. Um, I, I think asking people to solve a puzzle is worthless. I know a lot of companies enjoy doing that. I, I think that, and unless the job is specifically to solve puzzles, I, <laughs> I don't think we should be doing that. I wouldn't that. be good at that job. And, and our work is not solving puzzles, although you know, we might think it is. It's to you know, build stuff that works. So I want to see a portfolio. I want them to come in with um, particularly open source stuff or, or stuff that they wrote on, on their own time and be able to justify it or, or defend it. You know, so we'll do a code review of the stuff they did and they'll talk us through what they did and, and what they think they did well and what they think they did badly. And we'll look at that and decide, yeah, this is someone we could probably train them and, and make them work for us. Steve, any thoughts? How to find a good engineer? Oh, uh, no, I have nothing to add. I'm sorry, I was drifting. I was thinking ahead. <laughs> Mike? Uh, yeah, I think the the age of like the logic puzzle interview is, you know, I think we've pretty much 
conclusively understand that that's, that is not the most useful way to test for anything at all. Um, I do like pair programming with people and you know solving a problem together because you can kind of, you, you're making decisions with this other person as you go along and you know you, you can like as, as you implement something, challenge like why did you do this? Why are we doing it this way instead of this other way? And uh, it kind of helps to, it's, it's not something that you can kind of study for and it's like a bunch of fact memorization, like how do you rebalance this tree and how do you check for the like, number of duplicate characters in this string in the most efficient way? Like all of these things, let's be honest, people study for and they like memorize common solutions to right before the interview. Now, if you're trying to hire someone, is that, that, that might be an important test for whether they really want to work for this company, whether they bothered to study, but it's not gonna tell you much about whether given a totally new problem, they're gonna be effective at reasoning their way through it. Sure, sure. So I think the, the question Steve's been dying to, to answer <laughs> is uh, biggest, biggest uh, sort of fear for the web or what are we doing wrong? What, what trends do we, do we have that, uh, that, that scare you about what's gonna make the web harder um, or worse? Any, any thoughts, Steve? Wow, I'm honored to be on, a, be on a panel with Doug Crockford, and I'm the one who's the scaremonger. You, you, brought, the, <laughs> wow. you brought the question up earlier, Steve. So this I, is a new I, level of achievement for me. <laughs> I think the biggest one, we've talked about both of them, or at least I mentioned one of them is, I think the biggest one is the social impact. I don't know about people, I've had to like, switch the way I use my phone because I've had repetitive stress uh, problems in my wrist and hands. Uh, I just think we've got to figure out a way to get more balance with online time and what we're doing on the web uh, and balance that with other things. And then the, the one that's maybe more appropriate for this panel is just code complexity. I just, you know, I don't want to pick on Google, but um, uh, I'm just amazed that I'm using Google websites that are, have errors and are incredibly slow. And I'm like, if Google can't solve this, who can? Uh, and the problem is it's just a really complex problem and you have to be diligent 24-7. I mean, you can't take your eye off it at all. So um, I think those, yeah, I think that's the, the scariest thing if we're gonna keep building websites is how are we going to manage the code complexity? Doug? Privacy. We have thrown our privacy away. Um, and we did it to get a few services on our phones and in our browsers. And I think someday we are going to regret it. I think your grandchildren are going to be really, really sad because of what we've done. So start getting your story straight because you're gonna have to explain this to them. Mike. I, uh, I, I share the complexity and privacy concerns and like I think of, I'm, I'm less scared of the Google story, more scared of the Equifax story where like we're at, we have these new features that are added to browsers and new ways of building applications and uh, we are growing that at a much faster rate than we can understand best practices and the ramifications of our choices. So, like, and now everyone, every American who has borrowed money, their social security number is out, out and somebody knows it. Um, and, and like with another example that we've been struggling with at LinkedIn is the ability to make a web app work offline. And like, this is a very tantalizing idea, right? We don't have to think about mobile apps. We can just use web technologies for this. But it is insanely complicated. It, it is like the perfect storm of multi-threaded programming and, you know, like having to deal with things that have different life cycles. And um, people tend to jump into this without even the ability to instrument it properly, right? People are, are re like releasing this stuff out into production and they, they don't even have the ability to understand how much of the time is this failing and interfering with someone's experience. So I would love to see us move a, a little more slowly and make sure we get it right before we 
start potentially inflicting harm and pain upon users. Yeah, so, so um, what about like more specifically, you know, if we drill down into something more like ES6, right? Is there, like what are things in ES6 that, that scare um, the panelists? Is there anything in there that like you think is, is you know, not the right direction, is, is, is going to be either difficult or cause more problems than it solves? I don't think there's anything scary there. It's just, um, you know, things like classes are a colossal waste of time, but um, I, don't, I don't see any greater threat there than that. I, I, um, there are other layers in the stack which are more problematic, you know, like the way we do secure networking. That's never worked. We, uh, DNS has problems. Certificate management has never worked. Um, but those are the roots of the way we do secure networking. So our, our security is rooted in the stuff that we know is failing. That, that's a problem. Yeah, yeah no, not, I agree with that. Nothing that scary. We're just adding more baggage and complexity. Uh, I, I'm a little fearful of the eagerness to adopt complexity. Like, I've seen a lot of pull requests in open source projects that are like changing all functions to arrow functions and like using um, ES proxies where another simpler approach that you know many more people could understand and debug that was working fine and we're just sort of using the new stuff for the sake of using the new stuff. Um, that scares me a little bit because again, it's adoption before we have a chance to really teach people how this works and shake the bugs out, you know, a lot of this is, like, some people are using things that aren't even um, finalized as part of any language yet, right? So I don't see a lot of thoughtful risk analysis being performed around this. So, so one of the things that I, I find myself doing a lot um, is I'll have some sort of, of, of service or API and I want to document an example of, of how to use it. Maybe I'll make some simple UI, some simple web application, um, you know, some simple example of using this. And, and traditionally, when I've always done that, um, I've said, well, let's, let's build this in JavaScript. Let's build something in JavaScript. Maybe it's in the browser, maybe it's in Node. It doesn't, you know, really matter. Just something to show calling these APIs and put maybe a little front end on it. Um, you know, for example's sake. And, you know, this notion of, well, everybody knows little JavaScript, everybody can read JavaScript, kind of is no longer true. And I usually, when I tell people, oh, you know, I'll go to a, an amazing Google engineer and say, write up some quick JavaScript example, and it will be JavaScript that 90% that of developers can't read. Um, and, I, and I'm wondering, you know, is kind of like is, is JavaScript harder than it's ever been um, for engineers to pick up? Um, you know, and I guess I, I'm kind of bridging this gap between those who specialize in it and those who don't, um, but definitely curious on any thoughts. Well, JavaScript started off as a very simple language designed specifically for beginners. Nice little language, had a lot of problems, but, you know, started off nice. Um, ES4 attempted to add a whole lot of crap. Fortunately, that one failed. Unfortunately, a lot of that crap survived and, and got into ES6 and other stuff. Like promises, I think, were a mistake. Uh, proxies, I think, were a mistake. Uh, classes, obviously, were a mistake. There's a whole bunch of stuff. The one thing in ES6 that was really good, tail calls, hasn't been implemented yet. So, you know, that happened. Yeah. Um. Another, another thing that, that I've always seen, you know, for the last 10 years is constantly we're finding some sort of, of issue, be it a performance issue or whatever it is, and we're, we come up with a, a set of hacks that everyone has to do um, because browsers aren't ready or specs aren't ready. Um, you know, a simple example would be like uh, one Mike listed, which was like putting script tags at the bottom of your page. Um, you know, like, what's the answer for, like, a limit? Like, I feel like these hacks that we do then make it even harder because we can't break the web. Um, 
you know, what, what can be done um, to either consistently make sure you're doing things that are forward looking, um, what can be done in the spec space, like to, to solve this problem, like any, any thoughts about um, the problem or the solution from the panelists? So we should be much slower and much more cautious in putting stuff into standards. Uh, we have standards groups which are doing research or, or creative exercises where they're just making stuff up and getting it in. I think standards should be codification of standard practice, not new inventions. It, it, we should be very careful. But uh, that's not the way it happens. So it, it's sometimes a competition where people are trying to get something in because their company has a short-sighted requirement or just for personal glory. You know, I, I can force Microsoft to implement this because I got it into the standard. Um, even if maybe we shouldn't cause anybody to implement that. Anyone we should else? be much more serious about this business. Yeah. I think it's kind of interesting. I think a lot of the, um, at least in the performance space, a lot of the advances that have been specced and adopted by browsers came from uh, hacks that people had deployed and were using. One example is the user timing spec is based on my open source JavaScript library named Episodes, one of the best names that I've ever had for a JavaScript uh, project and that name came from Doug Crockford. Oh. I asked him one day at Yahoo what I should call it. He said episodes. Fortunately, I watch a lot of television. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, that got widely adopted. You know, uh, half a billion people were using that library. Um, and when we went to do the user timing spec, we actually looked at the API for that and adopted the functionality from that. And so I like to think that Putting things like that out there help drive uh, what the committees are prioritizing as important features to add. But now people who adopted that library should chuck it and use the spec. And so it's kind of hard to put something out there to push the envelope, which then later is going to be outdated. I think Weislow is a better name, but... <laughs> Mike? I came up with that one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, who put a Y in front of everything for a very long time. Yeah. Um, so I, I have a question instead of uh, sharing my thoughts here, but like how would I do, how would I make a library version of something or how would I experiment in user space with something like tail calls? Like are, is there some subset of things that may eventually become specifications or are specifications that where we are limited from experimenting with first? Right, so tail calls is something that cannot be done in the language without modification. Uh, but our, our confidence in tail calls came from work that had been done in Scheme, you know, up to 40 years earlier. So we had a very long body of research which showed, in fact, this thing was sound and worth doing. Cool. So I wanna, you know, sort of wrap up the panel. We're about out of time. Uh, give folks time to get to their next uh, session. But before I do that, I want to go through uh, sort of each of the panelists and see if there's any anything you want to, you know, any closing comments or remarks or any tips for the audience or anything um, or any other topics you guys wanted to cover. So should we start with you, Doug? I've got a book coming out. There so, you go. Uh, look for it on Amazon. Hopefully it'll be there next week. I think something that uh, I've really appreciated in web development is how supportive the community is. And Silicon Valley Code Camp is an ex outstanding example of that. Um, the Frontiers Guild in Netherlands is another great example. So um, if you're not here, you should be here. But wait, you all are here. So keep keep coming to you can touch the video there. Keep keep oh yeah, there we go. So keep coming to things like this and, and also contributing. Um, you know, uh, it's important. So uh, Doug and I both have courses on front end masters. He's got an amazing JavaScript course 
And I have a couple on there on like basic web security, if you don't know about that and you're interested in that, uh, and a variety of other topics. So uh, check that out if you want to hear us drone for an extended period of time. Cool. Awesome. Well, I want to thank the panelists uh, for coming out. Uh, another great, uh, you know, 13th uh, annual Silicon Valley Code Camp, uh, 2018. Uh, I want to thank all the audience uh, for coming out um, today and enjoying. I hope everyone uh, enjoyed, uh, you know, Code Camp so far and the rest of the today and tomorrow. And I'm sure that uh, the panelists will stick around for the next uh, 10 minutes or so. If you have any questions, feel free to come up and ask. Frontendmasters.com. Cool. All right. And thanks to Kevin for pu pulling this together. Yep. Appreciate it. Thank you, uh, Kevin. Yeah, thanks, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>